The Pod Barber. Coming up on today's show... I have no interest in saving the planet. That's not what I do. The planet is going to be fine. Mm. It'll carry on circling, going around, spinning once every 24 hours and around the sun every 364 and a quarter days or whatever it is. We're not going to change that. We are just making the planet totally inhospitable to ourselves. Millions and millions of people are going to die. And therefore, what we're trying to do is save humanity. How is it that people haven't got their selfish gene operating on this, that this is about looking after ourselves survival. and our children, our survival? But when you have this phrase, save the planet, as if it's something like, oh, what shall I put 10p in a collecting box for this weekend to save? Oh, well, maybe I'll save this little planety thing. That's so arrogant. We've just got to save ourselves. That's what this is about. You're listening to The Pod Baba. I'm champing in the chat, proving conversation is the cure to better mental health and well-being. Meet my guests from all walks of life, showing vulnerability and sharing wisdom. Sit in on my chats and be part of reality entertainment. Join the Pod Barber tribe, subscribe, share and like people. Feel the sonic positivity we're pumping right at you. You, my friends, are not alone. Who's next, please? Well, I'll tell you who. Today, we warmly welcome Edward Gilday to The Pod Barber HQ. The environmental activist has his heart set on turning up for the planet he loves, for his children and grandchildren, the future generations who will follow in our footsteps. Inspired by his adventures around the world, sailing and mountaineering, Edward developed a bond with nature, leading to a desire to do his part in protecting it. As our world moves ever closer to irreversible climatic change, with rising temperatures, we appear to be sailing close to the edge of no return. Global action is required. Governments have come together to drive big projects and climate policy. But success is only possible with us all part of the solution. So what can we all do? A shift in our mindset has to be the medicine for our planet's health. Urgency to rethink our planetarium relationship has fallen upon this generation. There's a call to arms for all humans. Today we need to be optimistic, listen to a deeply passionate man and be inspired, or simply ignore everything and continue to bury your head in our ever-polluted sands. It's not too late. There's new hope with new technologies and massive investment in emerging talent to seriously supercharge adaptation. Could it be the Green Party that helps steer us to a sustainable balance to thrive within? I'm excited to listen to this former head teacher, poet, global adventurer, public speaker and determined environmental activist share from his experience, his connectedness to this cause. It's time to point some positivity back to planet Earth, so stop scrolling and start listening to the one with Edward Gilday. (laughs) <laughs> that's brilliant thank you so much that's just lovely it well, says it all yeah. welcome to the show <laughs> thank you <laughs> well it doesn't say it all you're going to say the most of it but it's it's a worthy intro for what is really the cause and you're the, the speaker for the day for the cause it's the environment isn't thank it thank you yeah tell us a little bit about what you're doing now what you're up to well, I'm, I'm partly kind of recovering a little bit from the ring out for climate. So I had this idea back in summer of trying to get church bells around the country. And I didn't expect it to be around the world, but it did prove to be around the world to to ring out as a warning on the eve of COP26. And I just started pushing this idea and then started emailing bishops uh, and emailed bishops in Australia as well. And we ended up getting 24 of the big cathedrals in this country, the beautiful cathedrals, ringing out on the eve of COP26, including St. Paul's and York Minster and Durham Cathedral and in Glasgow itself. And thousands of churches up and down the country from Jersey down in the south to the Shetland Islands and across from Cornwall to deepest Suffolk. And more were ringing out from uh, New York across Ontario and Colorado to Vancouver and Seattle and British Columbia or whatever. It was just amazing. So I'm in the process of writing back to the bishops and to the archbishop saying this meant a lot to a lot of people. Not only were they ringing bells, but they were saying prayers and having candlelit vigils and involving their families and their children. It gave them the chance to express their concern, their fears, their passion for climate change and the environment. And that gave them a sense of a voice. And that was very powerful for them and powerful of the church. And it does put pressure on the politicians. But you're going to have to do it again, guys, because this problem hasn't gone away and there'll be a moment when you've got to ring out that warning to humanity again. So I'm still kind of following that up with the archbishops and I thought I'd better write to the Pope as well. You know, he's got a lot of bells. (laughs) When I found out about this movement, it was very well televised. It was on the eve of COP26. It was probably one of the more 
positive get togethers and it mm. just showed, like you said, how important people wanted to be part of something and, and the voice would not get inside there, but the, the ringing of the bells, that connectedness outside, that mm. did send a strong message. It was featuring in newspapers in Byron Bay and places you can't pronounce in, in Australia. I won't attempt to. But you're just thinking, how the heck did I reach Australia from my kitchen? It was so thrilling. In India, there's, you know, there were, you know, if you Google it, you're just thinking, oh my gosh, there's a newspaper in India that was covering in Bombay, Mumbai or wherever. When I first you know, wrote to the archbishop, so I thought they'd just say, well, thank you, Edward, but you know, a dozen of us have already had that idea, so don't worry your little head about it, and that would have been it. You know? And then thinking, no one else had this idea? Really? But it's up to me then. I better get moving. Don't underestimate what you can achieve if you really want to set about doing it. You know, it wasn't heroic. It was just slog. Keep going. And then you hit the politics that you didn't. I mean, I'm not a bell ringer. I didn't know anything about the politics of bell ringing, how finely, delicately balanced it all is. I just was, you know, went in like a bull in a china shop. It's about a month ago now, isn't it? By the time mm. this comes out, probably a couple of months ago. We have to have a permanent effort to translate into something practical, isn't it? Mm. So... To make that practical movement, to have that continued pressure, it's got to keep coming from every angle. It can't just come from the, the churches allowing the bell ringing to be done coordinated like that. It's got to come from businesses. It's got to come from schools. It's got to come from all of us. Yes. And there's a long way to go on that in, into winning hearts and minds and recognising the depth of the challenge and the depth of the problem that we're facing. It's a, and it's a very hard message to get across because it's not a message anyone really wants to hear because it is so very frightening and it frightens me. I am on the edge of kind of hope and despair every day really about this. It's like climate anxiety, isn't it? If you're aware of what's going wrong, it feels some days you wake up and you, <clears throat> you do have that sense of real dread for what could this be like for my kids, my grandkids? Yes, and uh, that is a frightening prospect and it is going to be bad. And in one sense, there is no hope. In my head, there is a very clear message saying there is no hope. So that I know that when I die, the planet will be far, far less inhabitable than the one I inherited. And there is, there's no alternative to that because we're still emitting CO2s. Uh, we all talk about getting to carbon zero by 2050. and We're not on track to do that. Carbon zero will be the moment where the planet is at its worst. So between now and then, we're going to carry on emitting CO2s. And that is going to make extreme weather events worse and worse and worse, probably on an exponential curve. Getting to carbon zero by 2050 or 2060 is just the start of the race that our children are going to have to run. Because everything will have got worse because the climate will have deteriorated with all our emissions. And at that point, when we get to carbon zero, only then... Will our grandchildren start the process of taking the climate gases out of the atmosphere and reducing those slowly over the second half of this century so that by the end of this century, we might be back to the level of extreme weather events we're experiencing now? But between now and the end of the century, it's bound to be worse. And, and then in terms of sea level rises, that's going to be centuries. When I look at it like taking our species away, would this be happening anyway? So would... You know, we'd be seeing volcanic actions and stuff like this. The planet sort of naturally purging and yeah. coming off of that period. Obviously, we, I definitely think we're tilting it out. We're, oh, we're, we're massively. agitating I mean, everything. What we are doing, the trillions that we're putting into the atmosphere of the tons is way, way, way in excess of what volcanoes do. We depend on volcanoes. We wouldn't exist if we didn't have volcanic activity on this mm. planet. You know, you need the volcanoes to actually put the CO2 up into the atmosphere for the plants to live on. I mean, the plants need CO2 to live and to photosynthesize and absorb and so on that's what they do so there is a, a natural balance and volcanoes are as part of that as our forests are but what we have been putting in and that the science is irrefutable now and is accepted as irrefutable is changing it at a rate an unbelievably fast rate mm. i mean we're talking you know the last 200 years that is a fraction of a second in terms of the history of the planet yeah exactly and it's been off the scale I know you said you've really got no hope. I'm, I'm, I still have to sit there with a little bit of hope because I think with the same poison that we can be, we can be the same cure, but that's a total shift in our mindset. Yes. I have to have hope because if you didn't have hope, you wouldn't do anything and you would just you know, climb into a hole. And... Mm. So I'm active 
because I have hope that we can do things that will make it fractionally less bloody awful than it's going to be, and maybe significantly less bloody awful than it's going to be, and that eventually we will turn it around. Millions and millions of people are going to die. That's unstoppable now. We've gone way, way past that point of thinking this isn't going to cost human lives because it already is, but it's going to be on a scale that we, we can't even conceive of. But we have the option of turning it around, and we've got the option of turning it around sooner rather than later. It's not going to happen overnight. We need, ha- but we need haste and emergency. We need haste, even to turn it around in the course of this century. Yeah. We've got to actually be acting very fast immediately to turn it around in the course of this century to get back where we are now. What did you see that came out of COP26 that was any good? That gives you a little bit of hope? Th- there wasn't a lot. The fact that they're going to review it every year. That instead of having you know a big review every five years, to actually hold themselves accountable for are you coming up with your national deliverables and reductions on a yearly basis? So holding them to account every year that's huge. I mean, it was great that they actually mentioned fossil fuels in the text, thinking, hold on, you've been having these for a quarter of a century and you've not named. Coal and oil and gas as the enemy here, and we have actually finally got you to agree to name them. I guess that was huge, but I mean, the frightening thing was that they hadn't been named before. That's just negligent. I mean, our politicians have been grossly negligent. Even the good ones have been grossly negligent on this. They're sort of bound, aren't they, in their historic, mm. their growth. The vested interests and the money. It's the so money has controlled away, isn't it? our behaviour on this one. The money, the investment, the fossil fuel industry with its billions of resources putting out kind of fake science. And, and it's worked. And it, it's worked in the same way, exactly the same way as the, the tobacco companies did over lung cancer and cigarettes. They put out disinformation for years and acted in the most reprehensible way. And they've been doing, the fossil fuel industries have learned from that and have applied the same techniques. Absolutely appalling. The strategies of these big players is all profit-based. It's all pay Mm. pay out the dividends. It's the shareholders. And then they do the lobbying. They use that money to do their lobbying and the lobbying works. And, you know, green movements haven't got that lobbying power. How How does a green movement gain its credibility? Well... It's interesting. Almost exactly three years ago to the day I was with Extinction Rebellion standing outside the BBC in London, just just north of Oxford Circus there, and shouting at them to tell the truth because the BBC were not telling the truth. Every time they had a climate uh, scientist on the Today programme, they would wheel out Nigel Lawson as a climate change denier. And their notion of balance was you have to balance climate science with climate change denial, and that's what balance is. And I was thinking, no, the balance is, what is the Tory party doing about it? What's the Labour party doing about it? And let's have a balanced conversation around there. And after a day shouting at them, the following spring, coming up for three years ago, they realised, because actually the scientists were saying, we're we're not going to come on your programme. We're not going to come on your programme and face a climate change denier who's coming up with absolute rubbish. And... They just realised that, you know, if Spurs beat Arsenal 3-0 over the weekend, you can't turn around and say, for the sake of balance, we're going to change that Arsenal beat Spurs for 3-0. I mean, the fact is fact. And they accepted that. And I think that also liberated Sir David Attenborough to be far more outspoken than he was. And the BBC output has changed massively in the last three years. So there is this huge groundswell. The political climate has transformed itself in the last three years. And even, you know, Extinction Rebellion, they, you know, did some blocking of bridges that summer on Sundays, so it didn't cause too much inconvenience to people. And when the Commons voted for their climate emergency bill, or or I'm not sure what the motion was, it was to get to zero by 2050 rather than a reduced percentage by 2050, every politician was standing up and praising David Attenborough Greater Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion. If you check your hands hard, you'll see the politicians are saying thank you to Extinction Rebellion for actually raising it 
and getting it into public because sometimes you have to do those things. If democracy was not working, democracy was not delivering any of those big change movements, you've got to you've got to push the edge a little bit. It wasn't that long ago where I remember many a conversation where people said, well, there's nothing I can do. And it became yeah. pretty disheartening to say that, no, no, you can, even if it's, we've got to be aiming towards, but realistically, yeah, the big policymakers, the big leaders, they, they're they the ones that have got to really come to the point, but we can all do something. Yeah, well, that that is the big dilemma of whatever I do, it won't make a difference. And it's a really tough one to take on board. My angle on it is that every one of us needs to tread more lightly on this planet and there must be no exceptions and not Richard Branson, not Elon Musk. There must be no exceptions to treading. We all count and we owe it to our children to do what we can do. And those little things will add up when you really connect deciding what you're buying, your lifestyle choices all makes a difference. But at the same time, we need our politicians to take the big political lead and the big fundamental and deep-seated changes that need to happen. So it has to happen on all levels. So in my life, I just have it in three little compartments. There are the things I do on a daily basis, dozens and dozens of little things to reduce my carbon footprint. Then there's all the stirring I try and do locally in my own community, in the local politics here or through the churches here or going into schools and doing assemblies or whatever, just my local activism. And then whatever I can stir up nationally. And hey, I didn't expect Ring Out for Climate to be so international as it was. But, you know, thinking you can do something internationally or nationally and, you know, get on that stage and do stuff through a Green Party system or your own political party, whatever it is. We, we live in a democracy. We have freedom of speech. We are so privileged in a way that they aren't privileged in China or Russia to be able to speak out and express ourselves and put pressure on our politicians and use the media. So get out there, use it. Mm, I totally agree. And, and I mean, the other little message I come up with is that I have no interest in saving the planet. That's not what I do. The planet is going to be fine. Mm. It'll carry on circling, going around, spinning once every 24 hours and around the sun every 364 and a quarter days or whatever it is. Quite happily, we're not going to change that. We are just making the planet totally inhospitable to ourselves and therefore what we're trying to do is save humanity and that's the bit that I don't get my head around how is it that people haven't got their selfish gene operating on this that this is about looking after ourselves survival. and our children our survival surely that should be the thing that kicks in but when you have this phrase save the planet as if it's something like, oh, what shall I put 10p in a collecting box for this weekend to save? You know, what, what little charitable donation shall I make? Oh, well, maybe I'll save this little planety thing. That's so arrogant and so condescending. We've just got to save ourselves. That's what this is about. Mm, I totally agree, Edward. We, we were talking out there and I mentioned about the symptoms of us and our abundance of unhappiness mm. the root cause really to our greed and need is is our our unhappiness we're not an abundance of emotional connection anymore no. in the west through capitalism and then our consumerism and they both sort of just channel each other don't they mm. you know this idea of retail therapy we brandish things in such an awful way but therapy is about talking is about yes. commune with other people Connecting connecting i think we've we've lost that i think we've become very isolated as people yes we, we aren't connected with nature in the same way that we used to be and we don't connect with each other we connect virtually in a very distorting way and we're also not connecting you know when we're making a purchase we're not connecting with the chain of supply that brought that thing into the shop and whether it was environmentally friendly, whether it exploited people, whether the company producing it is paying their taxes or not. We need to connect with the stuff that we buy and we need to connect with the disposal chain. I mean, when you throw it away, where's it going to go? What's going to happen to it? You know, every time you make a purchase, you're kind of voting to be part of a supply chain and part of a disposal chain. And if those aren't moral, ethical, environmental, sustainable... Why the hell are you buying it? I really like the fact that you've used that terminology, actually, like voting mm. by by how you spend your money. We so, have huge voting power with how yeah, we spend our money. Yeah, I think, money. yeah, and we do. And also, for large parts of the, the UK and, and the, the Western civilised world, 
there's a lot of money that's being frittered mm. and wasted. Mm. So they're wasted votes, in all honesty. If you speak to people, how many people now, rising numbers of non-voters, because they just literally look at the parties that are available, the people, they've lost their trust, they've lost their willingness to be part of that system. Mm. Well, if you're that person, then spend and double down on how you vote with your your pound notes because yes. that's the driver on the real problem the root cause is the current model that we're working on of a consuming society that just wants to consume more and more and thinks it'll get more happy by consuming more and an eco model that says well unless you consume at this rate then people will lose their jobs at the same time as saying well we want to increase productivity and thinking well hold on what is productivity the way i see productivity is you get hold of some technology that puts a whole load of people out of work and that's increased your productivity or you've actually found a way of getting that labor more cheaply by outsourcing it to the Philippines or India or somewhere and that's increased your productivity. So hold on, how does productivity benefit society? I can see how it benefits the shareholders and the managing directors and the people at the top of the company because their profits are going up and they're getting their bonuses so they're thinking, oh, we've increased our productivity. But for actually, in terms of the rich and the poor in this country, I'm not sure how productivity helps the majority of average and poorer people in this country. I, I, we need to take that word productivity apart and find out what is it really doing and is it making us happier or healthier. Mm. We've got to find some practical solutions. We've got to give, mm. Do you know what? We've got to give people something to think about. You've mentioned to me about cathedral thinking. Yeah. And for me... That's something that I can visualise because I can see a historic message that we can live with and adapt to today. Can you explain to me what cathedral thinking is? Yeah, so it's a lovely idea. I mean, when you're just thinking of our wonderful cathedrals and the people who built them, the stonemasons and the labourers and so on, and they were building something for future generations that they couldn't even conceive or dream of, and they probably would die before the cathedral was, was completed... And then centuries later, those those buildings are giving us joy and fulfilment and so on. And then you think of kind of Bazaljet building the sewage systems of London, you know, and engineering it to such a high standard for a population of London that he could not conceive of for centuries to come, that that, that sewage system by Bazaljet is still functioning. They're only now beginning to replace it down on, on the embankment in London. But what a contribution to humanity. And it is that notion of having a long time scale. If we're going to save ourselves on this planet and look after environment, we need to have that long-term thinking. And the trouble is, democracy can't deliver that. Democracy is a wonderful system of government, but it can't do long-term. Because you want to be able to re-elect a government every four or five years, and therefore that government wants to be re-elected. So it's got to be popular within four or five years. They can't afford to do difficult things that, that, that will for future generations. So that's why climate change has been kicked by the successive governments of all types and across the world, thinking there's some long grass we can kick this ball into. And democracy hasn't delivered. So I've got this little idea that is going to be my, my little task for the new year, which is to continue and complete the reform of the House of Lords. And I want the House of Lords to be the future generation's revising chamber. I want that to be the body that represents young people and generations yet unborn. And when, as legislation comes up from the Commons to be reviewed, revised, amended, their prime directive is to consider the interest of future generations and to think long term. And that means totally changing the way it's structured and my little plan for that is we want it to have somehow be democratically accountable and yet to have that long-term vision. You want to have people in there who are thinking of legacy and not popularity. So I would reduce it from 800 people in the House down to 312. The 12 would be the bishops. I'll reduce them pro rata, but I'm not going to try and disestablish the Church of England. That would upset the Queen and I don't want to do that. So you'd have 300 of them would be directly elected by the people on a proportional representation basis. And they would have a term of eight years and they are not allowed to stand again. So they've got eight years to make a real contribution that would be great for their career and great for their contribution to humanity. 
but they can't be re-elected, so they will think of legacy. And that would be a democratic mandate they've got directly from the people. Then the next tranche of 30 would be selected by their political parties and in proportion to the popular vote at the previous election. So it's a kind of proportional representation number that they would have. And that would mean political parties could select the really motivated members of their parties who are really interested in climate or in energy or forestry or whatever it is. They could select 18-year-olds. So you could have 18-year-olds in the House of Lords. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Young people with a real interest in the future. They could also select the geeky people, you know, the people who work on the spreadsheets and have done the sums and understand the complexities of the economy of energy reduction, energy production, sustainability, land use, how much salt marsh we need or how much peatland we need and have done all that work and have got something to contribute, have got expertise, but would be hopeless standing in an election. They just wouldn't cope with that, you know. So you could really select the best people. And that would be reflecting the popular vote in that proportion. And then finally, you'd have they would have eight years and they might be reselected, but almost as a kind of performance review, not because they wanted to be popular, but have you actually over your 80 years, have you done put the eight years to good use and made a difference? And then the last lot would be the great and the good. So that would be sort of the Tammy Gray Thompsons, the David Attenboroughs, the people who've made a lifetime's contribution to science or technology or to medicine or disability sport or arts or whatever it is, who've got that wisdom, got that experience. And we really want to capitalise on that. And they would be cross branches. They wouldn't have a political allegiance because they would have been in the second tranche and give them 12 years, maybe renewable if they haven't got dementia after that. <laughs> and then we might we might actually have built a democratic system that will work. The House of Commons is always going to have to be short termist because it's got to be re-elected. We've you've got to have the people have got to have the power to get rid of a government. Mm. So that's got to be the way that operates. But you know we've got a, a totally. I mean, the upper house is a mess. You know, eight hundred people paid enormous expenses, great expense to the taxpayer, um, very inefficient mostly conservative, whoever is in power and, you know, can just select at will or whatever number they like. A lot seem to be Tory donors that seem to get a place in the House of Lords. As the light is shone upon all of these people, they can't hide anymore. LEDs. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're efficient light sources, <laughs> yes. aren't they? We can all see you, you yeah. cheeky bastards. They're, yes, they're, the they're, truth will they're out. They're taking full advantage of their situation. So we do need a huge change. You, you called it a little change. I think that's a big change. But how, <laughs> how is that going to happen? How are you going to get your message well, across? I, d- I mean, well, firstly, I will... You're um, here on the pod, Barber. <laughs> yeah, that's a, this is a start. This is a start. Maybe I've persuaded we'll one or two you. people. Yes, we'll oh, that's a good idea. Um, and I will try and uh, push it through the various levels of policy development in the Green Party. Um, I might share it with, you know, I've got a brother who's, you know, votes Labour. So, you know, say, why don't you share it with the Labour Party, see if they are interested. But no, I will have it having written to hundreds of bishops, writing to 800 peers. Well, that doesn't phase me at all. I'll just I'll consult a little bit more. But then once I think I've got a workable idea, I might as well email every peer in the country. And if you just get half a dozen of them thinking, wow, because I suddenly realised with the Ring Out for Climate, I assumed someone else would have had that idea. Well, they didn't seem to have done. And maybe no one's had this little idea in my head on this. And maybe I could sow a seed in half a dozen influential people in the House of Lords who actually pick up and run with it. It would it would require the House of Common Sense. Yes, it would just. <laughs> hey there, it's Howie. Just interrupting really briefly, I've got a quick favour to ask. We don't run ads on the Pod Barber, but if you're finding this podcast helpful, or if you know someone who might benefit from listening to it, please take just 10 seconds to share this episode by tapping on those three little dots on your podcast player. From there, you can text or email the link to the show and spread the word of what we're trying to do here. That'd be great. Mick and I really appreciate your help. Okay, back to the show. The cathedral thinking as well, it, what I think it does is it helps normal folk be able to visualise the fact that these stonemasons, these forestry commissions, they've been growing and nurturing something mm. that would then be built by somebody else, which would then be enjoyed by future generations, which would then enjoy the yes, c- keeping yes. us 
as one so that there's the, the sense of that history yes. plays forward. We've got to be in the present moment, which is the fight for now, but yeah. as well as our need for innovation within green technologies, how do we harvest? There's, there's not enough wind. There's not enough sun. What are your thoughts on well, that? Well, let's just go back to the thing there's not enough energy. The, 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 the sun gives us as much energy in one hour as the human race needs for a year. We've only got to harvest a tiny percentage of the energy that the sun gives us to get by. The, the, the technology is there, and that's, I think it's a totally solvable problem once there is a political will behind it. Every country in the world has got a means of being self-sufficient in energy, whether they're going to be used hydro or solar or tidal or whatever it is. So we never need to have another war based on securing your supplies of oil. But most of the wars in the last sort of century and a quarter have been about securing your supplies of oil. The world could be a better place. You know, having paid billions of dollars to Saudi Arabia for their oil, that we then have to export to them billions worth of arms industry, you know, arms, which then goes to fight the war in the Yemen. We don't have to pay that money to dubious dictators and regimes around the world who that we think we're feeling pretty uncomfortable about their lack of human rights. We don't have to pay them that money anymore. I mean, the geopolitics around this of a world that doesn't have to fight over oil anymore, that's a better world, isn't it? That gives me hope. It's got to be the way forward. But, yeah. you know, what, look at Africa just, you know, in the last decade or two, they've been hoodwinked because they've got these tyrannical leaders, mm. you know, these despots all fighting and arguing over everything historically. Yes. And the Chinese have then been able to come in and lay the infrastructure for what would look on the outside the betterment of these places to sort of try and move them forward. Yeah. But unpaid debts and stuff have led them to sort of handing over their continent, you yes. know, and I say a continent as opposed to just parts of countries for mining, for, yeah. you know, and humans are miners. We dig, we, we take stuff um, and we use it and we trade it and we, we value those things, don't we? We want all these mm. materials out of the mm. world to make our things. Yes, yes. The things that we all want. Yes. The system that operates, the, the global e economics works on the basis that we've got an infinitely exploitable and infinitely pollutable planet. Mm. And that's its premise. We didn't realise really that that was the underpinning premise of, of how capitalism works, but it does work on the basis of an infinitely pollutable, infinitely exploitable planet. And the notion of growth, we just want, oh, we just want 2% growth, which doesn't sound too bad. But 2% growth means that you kind of double the economy in kind of, you know, 40 years, and then you you quadruple the economy in the, for the next 20 years. And it's, you're, it's an exponential. 2% yeah, is an balance. exponential one. And we ran out of planets on the way the economy works at mm. the moment. So somehow we've got to invent one planet economics, an economic system that fits on one planet. And we haven't got it at the moment. And it's got to be evolved and devised and subscribed to. On that note, donut economics. What do you know about donut economics? It is basically about having every sector of, of an economy, whether it's agriculture or industry or travel or transport or domestic consumption, to fit within the bounds of one planet. So that at the moment, you know, from this donut diagram, you know, we, we are shooting out, we exceed what the planet can supply and what the planet can cope with on the one hand. And on the other hand, on the inside of the donut, we've got kind of deprivation and poverty and, and a lack of human rights and justice, social justice of, of people. And it's thinking, how can we just bring that deficit, that excess, rein that in and actually have an economic system that has social justice and fits within one planet and actually gives us all a better and healthier and happier life? I like the fact, again, it's a bit like cathedral thinking in the sense that you can visualise something. It's been presented to many governments and many different policymakers, schools, businesses, and it gives you this visual, like mm. a doctrine, so you can actually see something. And, yes. it, and it can be represented for 
the individual, the household, yes, the town, the city, the country, the continent, you know, relationships yes. with planet systems. It's yes. a fantastic it's theory. Lovely. Yeah. I'm not saying that that's the end result of it, but much like your the ringing of the bells before on the eve of COP26, it's a really good start with something, yes, isn't it? It's, yes. So we need to come up with yeah. these new ways. Now, donut economics. Yes. When uh, I first heard of it, I thought, oh, that must be for donuts like me. But it's not. <laughs> no. It's actually really clever. It's a lovely and diagram. It's very simple. It's a lovely diagram, and it's beautiful. The other one is circular economics. And and that's just the thinking we need to get things round in circles, you know, mm. and, and they're reused and recycled. And we're not then digging out more. We're just re repurposing what we've got. Obviously, the you know, you were talking about this circular kind of thing. And I think it's brilliant. The, the donut expresses these mm. two centric rings mm. that really work together and, and they give you a, a viable space, a sustainable space to live within the means of the planet. Yes. But with everyone having an inclusive opportunity to be there. And yes. we talk about growth, GDP. Mm. We need to change our mindset on this. Growth shouldn't necessarily be about growth. It should be about thriving, balanced. Absolutely. And then there is quite a strong movement saying we need to change the concept of gross domestic product, GDP, which everyone takes as the measure of everything, you know, that, that matters and politicians will throw it around that we've grown this much as, a, as if that's a good thing and, and change it. And the Green Party is doing a lot of work on this in terms of, you know, well-being. We've got to have well-being in there somewhere. The, 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 the GDP only measures a very limited numbers of metrics and it doesn't measure care and it doesn't measure volunteering and it doesn't measure health. I mean, there are so many things uh, above all well-being and happiness. I mean, you're thinking it's not a quality of life thing. It's a very mechanistic and very limited model. And, and we've been bowing down towards it for decades and decades. And it needs to be replaced. We've got to replace GDP with something else if we're going to get out of the circle to destruction that we're on. Well, we're moment. not in a circle. We're in a linear a path. It's linear, just a whatever. path at it the moment. Path, yes. It's not a circle. A circle, <laughs> a circle sort of no, you're right. goes round. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're just heading in one direction. I yeah. think that's yeah. clear to see. Yeah. But yeah, with the well-being, in a Western society, the majority of us We'll sit there and want to buy our way out of being unhappy because it will make us feel better. Yes. But that is at the cost to someone else. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and this is where you said about making your vote. So how do we get at that shift in the mindset to say to people, you've got to think. You've got to think first. Thinking things through, connecting. And a, and a compassion for, for others, but also for those others that we will never meet. We yeah. care. Yeah. I don't see that enough from the West? I think we all think we've got freedom of choice and that what we are doing is our own free will. And actually, for a lot of the time, we're being manipulated. Mm. Advertising works. A whole load of our economy wouldn't exist if advertising didn't work. So we all go around thinking, I'm not affected by advertising. I'm bigger than that. And yet somehow that advertising is turning us into consumers of those products those foodstuffs or whatever it is. And, and, and the same with, with Facebook and with social media. We're actually being manipulated all the time. And, and the extent to which we have free will is quite an illusion unless mm. you really cut yourself off. My inspiration comes from the sailing I did, a lot of it. So you're at sea for, for seven months or whatever. You're not exposed to any of this. What you are exposed to is the wind and the rain and the currents and you are so connecting to nature and the planet. Let me just try and describe helming, being at the helm and connecting. And we had a skipper. My first skipper had a rule. She said, the, the rule about helming is helm and breathe. That when you're helming, the only thing you're allowed to do, the only other thing you're allowed to do is breathe. You're not allowed to talk. You're not allowed to say, hey, there's a whale or a dolphin. You're not allowed to drink. You're not allowed to eat. You can only breathe while you're helming because she wanted us to really connect with every shift in the wind, every behavior of the boat, every flutter in the sail, every dip of the bowsprit against the horizon, every lift you can feel under your feet of the stern as a wave lifts you at the stern and the sound of the waves behind you as, as you know in your wake. All of that is feeding into you and then you're making all these little changes on the helm without thinking about it. You're processing all that to maximise the performance for the boat, but also to stay in control without the... Because, you know, the waves and the wind will flatten you. If, if you lose control, 
and you don't react ahead of the impact of the waves. So that degree of connection was hugely powerful and visceral. And then I had experiences of the planet overheating of the planet. I mean, first of all, as you approach the tropics coming up through the Coral Sea and towards the Bismarck Sea, you are seeing enormous cloud formations that go up miles into the sky and you're having to make a judgment. You're kind of measuring the height of this cloud formation, thinking, are we going to change course? Do we need to change sails down now? Or can we hang on to our larger sails for a bit longer? But because you're racing, you want to have maximum canvas up for as long as you can. You're making those judgment calls on the basis of your reading of that. But you're going through where hurricanes and tornadoes are being born, uh, as cyclones are being born. So you're aware of that energy that's coming out of the ocean and it's the heat we've put into those oceans that is determining extreme weather events right the way down to two kilometers of depth is getting hotter down two and three kilometers down beneath the surface that energy is going to go somewhere so you end up by doing the sailing that i've done being so connected to the energy of the planet and then that ties in with the science when someone talks about the science or the statistics or whatever it is, it makes sense to you. And then that was coupled with the birth of two of my grandsons were born while I was out there. So, you know, you connect that with a significant moment in that journey and, and you're just thinking, I've got to do the rest of my life. This is what I've got to do. Strong, mm. really powerful. It's, not, it's so nice to hear because it sounds like such a beautiful experience yes. where you become, you breathe as one with Mother Nature's oh God, yes, ferocity. So, yes. It's just connecting with nature and having the most amazing experience. And to partner that with finding out you're a grandparent yeah. on oh, several God. of your races to have so powerful your family to be mm. away from them at that time yeah. as well, obviously by choice, but mm. it's it's pretty big. And when you're, you feel so small when you do in the ocean and, yes. you know, how did that blow up the need even further for the planet? Well, it's, it's funny. I mean, the, the, when you use the word small, I mean, on the one hand, you're, you're crossing an ocean, you do feel small. The boat feels small and the Pacific seems huge or whatever it is and the waves are big and you think this is a huge planet. And then I remember getting to San Francisco having spent four weeks coming across from Qingdao and thinking, well, we did that at about a jogging speed. You're doing about averaging eight knots, 10 miles an mm. hour, jogging speed. How far could I jog in four weeks? Not a lot, not very far. Thinking, is that the biggest ocean you've got? Mm. This can't actually be a very big planet. And if little old me can sail around this whole planet, it cannot be a very big planet. It's actually tiny. And then when I have, do do some talks in schools, I put up a slide of the transit of Venus. See, remember the transit of Venus, every 10 or 15 years it comes out and you can make a little pinhole camera in a cornflakes box and, 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 and see the image of the sun. And you've mm -hmm. got the image of the sun and this little tiny little dot of Venus going across the face of the sun. So if we went out to Mars and look back at the time of the transit of Earth, you'd look at the sun, the sun would be a bit smaller, and there'd be this tiny little dot going across the face of the sun, and that would be Earth. Mm. We're one tiny little dot going around the face of a fairly average sun. We are tiny. So this strange paradox of both feeling nature is huge and I'm tiny, and then having got around the world thinking, actually, the planet is tiny, and yet it's full of so much ego. How can so many men have so much ego and think they're so bloody important, mostly men, some mm. women, but mostly men, yeah, no, agree. Um, when we're on this tiny little rock, incredibly delicate, beautifully balanced, because it can't ever, ever be anything other than balanced. There's nothing else to balance it with. Beautifully balanced, the most exquisite planet, and we're being so appalling to it. It's got to the point, and I said it in the intro, it's up to this generation mm. to truly tilt that. Yeah. I think it's been a whisper now. It's a, it's a very loud noise for loud. many. Yeah. How do, with the Green Party, I want to vote for the Green Party. Back well, and, do. And, Hopefully um, I'll be selected as the candidate in the next election. Uh, well, fingers crossed. We, I'd love to. We need I'd love to, to be. <laughs> we need to... We don't have the right system, like you mentioned before, with... 
it's first past the post, isn't it? So we don't mm. have that proportional representation. No, no. Well, that that is the problem. We've got a system that is so keeps the power within the two main parties, and and it's really hard. In one sense, I kind of thinking. Let's have the the Green Party generating the ideas about how the future should look, and how we can do it. And please, if the other political parties want to come along and steal our ideas, do, do it. Because what matters is our survival, mm. and it doesn't matter if the Green Party doesn't get ever get into power. It's already too late for us to get into power. I would have to be the prime minister now, you know, really, and it's it's too late. For us to get into power with the system as it exists, in order to turn things around, because things have got to be turning around today.、Mm. So we just need the other political parties to nick our ideas. Yeah, that friendship and relationship,、mm. and that that sense of how you've you are going to write to the eight hundred people. Yeah, you need one or two of them to have got to their position and realised. How folly it's all been, and、yeah. and their grandparents, their parents, their, yes, they their, are. They're、yeah. futurists. And if I can just strike that chord, if my little email strikes those chords, and they're thinking, "Oh my goodness, here's the solution I've been looking for." Thank you, Edward. Wow. Yeah. It, well, it can it can just turn into a relay, then, doesn't it? So、mm. instead of the hundred meter sprint to the end, it's the four hundred meter relay on repeat. Yeah. Pass yeah. the baton on. It's got to shift, hasn't it?、It's、I think、to. it's. I think it's the. It's our population. I think it's. We're a parasite, and we're just pillaging and stealing everything. Yes. Yes. And parasites, they'll come to their end if they don't sort themselves out. I kept bees for many years, and、uh, that taught me about the varroa mite,、oh, which gosh, is、right. the parasite which the media or the press at the time would have had you believe that. Yep,、yeah, that's the problem. That's what's doing the bees in. But it's not. It's pathogens,、mm. uh, you know, and and. We're we're the biggest pathogen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're not we're not the as the water melts. The need for adaptation to live and thrive within as our seas rise, we're going to have to do that. That's the bit that 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 is the bit that is perhaps most scary is the sea level rise because turning around that melting of the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland, and they are enormously thick ice sheets.、Mm. We're talking phenomenally quantities of you know depths of you know, kilometers deep of of ice. That doesn't get that doesn't get changed for centuries. I mean, I haven't a clue how long that's going to take. But meanwhile, the sea levels will 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 rise, and and that's going to put some major cities in India and Pakistan or Bangladesh and and Florida.、Um, it would be nice if Florida went first, to be honest, because、um, that might it would、things. make more、it、of would, a no. It would focus minds, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd also see, like, but, you know, you sort of think with China, they have low-lying cities. China, well. well, China will lose three major cities.、Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've got a kind of perverse faith in China. I mean, you know, in terms of human rights, absolutely appalling. What they're doing to the Uyghurs is appalling. What they're doing in Hong Kong is terrible. But in terms of climate change, the top ten solar panel producing companies are all Chinese. I think eight out of the top wind turbine companies are all Chinese. They are way in the lead in terms of manufacturing the green tech solutions. They're burning a whole load of coal. I wonder why. It might be because we've said, China, can you build all this stuff for us? Can you do our our white goods? Can you do our mobile phones? Can you produce our car components? Can you do our clothing? Can you do all this stuff for us? Oh, and by the way. We want it to be really cheap. Yeah, we don't really want to pay for it. We know because we want to sell it in Primark or wherever. It was got to be really, really cheap, and therefore you've got to use the cheapest method of production. Oh, and what's that? Oh, it just so happens to be coal from Australia. Hey,、mm. so they're burning coal on our behalf because we want them to produce all the stuff for us at the lowest possible price,、mm. and that's insane. And we've got to own that carbon footprint. It, the average Chinese person has got a fraction of the carbon footprint of the average Brit. Mm. And we, yeah, we're blaming them. I mean, on my tombstone, I want written "Sorry, kids, but I did my best." I don't want it to say "Sorry, kids, but I was waiting for China." China knows its air pollution is just appalling,、yeah. and so the health problems they are getting are massive. It's going to lose three major cities as with as oceans rising. They've got huge problems that they have got to solve. They tend to, I think, underpromise and overdeliver. And being a dictatorship, they just need the dictator to click his fingers, and things will change. Whereas our democracy is going to take decades to do it. 
when they want to change, they will change. So if they're going to get carbon zero by 2060, which is pretty darn impressive, and to say, you know, they've only had a couple of decades of the benefits of fossil fuels, where we've had a couple of centuries of the benefits of fossil fuels. So we owe them 10 years. So we and need I think, to be prepared to have a balanced opinion on what is the root cause of the carbon footprint. Yeah. Just because it's not necessarily on my shore, it's because of my desire, my consumerism, my yeah. my need for non-real cost. It's not a you can have real cost. The, when we talk about costs, we've really got to work out how we're assessing that cost and check out how much of that cost is a cost that we're not paying, but we're going to ask our children to pay. Hmm. The cost of that pollution, the cost of removing those CO2 from the atmosphere, the cost of the consequences of that CO2 being in the atmosphere in the extreme weather events. Have we put everything, factored everything into the cost when we're saying, well, that's cheaper than that option? And we don't. We just look at the top line cost. And one of the, that's one of the fundamental kind of mindset things that we need to address is when we tend to look at the cost of something, we do it in what's in my pay packet, what's in this year's budget, what can I afford in this immediate time frame. And when we're talking about sustainability, we're talking in a time frame that is decades, generations, centuries. So we then always thinking going green is going to be more expensive. Being sustainable is going to be more expensive because we're working out the expense on a short time frame and then we're looking at sustainability on a long time frame. It doesn't work. You've got to put them in the same time frame. So you've got to work out what are our costs and what is the entire cost of the implications of what you're doing and its pollution cost, its disposal cost, and, and you know, over, over the same time frame. I mean, I remember sort of calling in when they were selling those kind of houses to, to over 50-year-olds. And I went in pretending to be a customer and saying, oh, you know, how close to zero carbon are you? And is it going to have to be retrofitted in 10 years time when or 20 years time when I'm 80? Because I don't want to buy one of your properties and find when I'm 80, I've got to retrofit it. Well, they didn't understand the question. And the developers are saying, oh, well, if we make a house kind of more sustainable, it's going to cost more. And I'm thinking, no, because if you're actually making it more energy efficient, there's going to be a massive saving over the next 25 years. Mm. It might cost you five or 10,000 more now, but over 25 years, how much is it going to save you? And then you're buying it on a mortgage over 25 years. So from day one, your fuel costs have come down. Your mortgage is up a bit. Your fuel costs have come down a load. Your quid's in from day one. So how are you assessing your costs and claiming it's all too expensive? Planning law is pretty much dictated by the developers. Currently it is, it isn't is, it? It is, really is, yeah. And, and, and the developers can take you to court. They can, you know, if, if, if a, a local authority turns them down, then the developers take the local authority to court and they've got deeper pockets and they can pay a fortune, whereas a local authority is thinking, well, this is taxpayers' money. I don't want to have to go to court, so we'll, we'll concede, you know, at the second appeal. They get bullied. They get bullied. And planning law doesn't seem to have caught up with climate change and environmental degradation and so on, and it, it needs to be changed, you know, so that we can actually put the environment first. You know, they talk about biodiversity plus, but I haven't worked out how they're measuring it, thinking... Biodiversity plus, you know, how are you measuring your biodiversity? Well, we, we might be counting the, the trees and how many bird boxes there are. And I'm thinking, yeah, but what about the soil? There are billions of microorganisms in a handful or a shovel full of soil. That's the biodiversity we all depend on. Mm. We depend on those fungi, on those microorganisms, the bacteria in the soil. That's where our food comes from. No one's counting that, are they, in biodiversity plus? But until we start to really value the quality of our soil and its ability to sink carbon as much as anything else, because, you know, you get sugars going down to that soil that feeds the microorganisms and the microorganisms are largely made of carbon. But developers just scrape the top soil off and flog it. If you go down to Lime Avenue, you're thinking, what's the quality of the soil that those pitches are growing on? It, it looks like subsoil to me with a bit of grass on the top. What happened to the topsoil? It's probably in some rich person's <laughs> raised bed yes. where, their, where, their, where their gardeners <laughs> sorting it out for them, maybe. I mean, soil is a different subject altogether, isn't it? Mm. But the desertification, which creates the, the mass exodus from uninhabitable places. 
Yes. You know, there's the reality of... The reality in sub-Saharan... When the grass doesn't grow in sub-Saharan Africa and then the cattle die, where are the people going to go? I mean, apart from they're going to die or else they're going to move. And then we're going to say, well, you're migrants and treat them so appallingly. But, you know, that that is the massive climate change issue. Mm. Migration will be on a scale that we cannot imagine at the moment. Because sometimes I think people lose track of trying to picture it. But when you look at the greatest movements of animals or fish as they migrate around the planet, chasing mm. the food, the energy that's creating their... They don't think like us. They just follow their pathway. Yes. They go in their millions. And humans will have to do Just the same. a species on you've this planet. Got, you, you're a human being. You've got to survive. You've got to go where there is water. You've got to find water. But they are going to be the most motivated people that, that have managed that journey and taken that risk. What an amazingly motivated workforce they are. I feel like we're, we're, we've got very comfortable being comfortable in the West. And then we know. look after me, me, me. It's become very insular, hasn't it? Mm. And um, that's where we need to change that. We need yeah. to sort of look at a symptom of happiness as in doing for others. The problem is if, if you are struggling with poverty, then poverty is the thing you've got to totally focus on. You can't wrestle with these deep-seated problems when you're just trying to get by from day to day and and we have to accept that that is just totally as as it must be and it is therefore the people who can afford who aren't in poverty who've got some flexibility who've got some wealth who've got some options who've got to start actually getting this ball rolling and choosing different options because they can afford to mm. so it's in a call to our elite our yeah. privileged. The privileged should be leading the way and they're not. I mean, they're, they're going off in their private jets, you know, and thinking they're exceptional. None of us must be exceptional. No, we all count. Actually, we all just count for one person. Yeah, one person on a little tiny rock that's going around the sun. Yeah. Um, want to just immediately run to my curveball question of sex, drugs and rock and roll. Yeah. Would you pick a topic for me? Well, you know, I have actually, I've never done the drugs. Mm -hmm. I tried a, f a couple of fags on a scout camp once, trying to drag on a fag and just choked me glutz out and think that was no good. So, and I remember kind of hitchhiking around, when I left school, hitchhiked around Europe and it was during the Vietnam War, loads of Americans on the draft and you know, met, I remember meeting on a beach on the Adriatic or something and they were passing a joint and I couldn't smoke the joint and I said, well, can anyone put this into a cake for me? Well, we sure that's not going to happen. So I have never really done drugs apart from, you know, a little bit of alcohol, which goes down nicely. Rock, I love dancing. So I do some Ciroc and I, I love expressing myself dancing. So I like the dancing bit, but it's, I don't do heavy rock. So the sex, I do like sex. Mm. And... Um. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we shall leave it there yes, anyway. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, following you on social platforms, or you know, encouraging you to come into schools, businesses, to give further talks, or mm. you know, how do people follow you? Stay in contact with what you're doing and support what you're doing. Well, if you just Google Edward Gilday, you'll find me. I've got a website which is edwardgilday.co.uk. You just have to spell the Gilday rather strangely, G-I-L-D-E-A, because it's Irish Latin and a little bit obscure. So I've got a website and contact me through the website and I would be just overjoyed to spread the message as far and wide as I possibly can. And also, can we expect the next cop to have more bell ringing? I am putting that to the Church of England uh, and that's Let them be take over. Let them take over. But they, you know, I've said, look, you've got a voice here. It's been proven and there you are going to need to do it again, but get the politics sorted out between yourselves and the church bell ringing union, the Central Council of Church Bell Ringers. That would be great. And, and see if we can get the Catholic Church involved and, and the other faiths involved and grow it. One last question. What inspired you to come on the Wellbeing Project, the Pop Barber Show today? Um, it was suggested by Chloe. I was chatting to Chloe. Chloe right. Fiddy, this is Chloe the, Fiddy, that's the, right. the wife yes. of the, our famous producer. Right. So, you know, I, I meet up with her from time to time and we discuss green things. And she mentioned this project and not being slow to come forward. I said, oh, I'd be delighted. Yeah, so. <laughs> it's been It's been great having you here. Change, it's not just a passive thing that happens. It's about normal people putting pressure on the, the big guys, isn't it? Mm. Organisations, companies. 
all of us coming together to work together and you're coming here today is that's just a, a mark of that we're mm. coming together we're trying to do our bit and yes. everyone needs to get that relationship in place don't they yes because everyone can do something and start with some small things but then don't stop there and just have a mindset that thinks about your carbon footprint every day and thinks about making connections what you're buying into in terms of supply chains and disposal chains, just connect and think of the consequences and think of the burden that you're passing on to your grandchildren. And even when you're young, you hopefully, happily have them. So yes. do it early. Do yes. it early. Yeah. Pre, pre-covery um, yeah. is a word I like to use for everything because yeah. it, it, it makes sense. Thank you for sharing today. It's been brilliant. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Peace. Love. And power to your day, Edward. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Wonderful. Mate. Thank you. The Pod Barber is a That Media and Design production with Mickey at the mic and Howie at the controls. If you've been affected by any of the topics in this show, you can find more helpful information on the episode's page at thepodbarber.com and search The Pod Barber on social and let's get connected. <laughs>